there she is. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> Hello. How are like you? Magic trick. Oh, magic. oh my gosh. <laughs> Hello, hi, Trisha Hersey. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? Are doing? you kidding me? Hi, everybody. Could you? I'm going to turn off the comments in a minute so that we can all just focus on you. But okay. could everybody just send up like huge hearts and love for Trisha Hersey? Let's like just flood. There you go. See all that? That's all uh, just pouring, pouring uh, love to you. Um, and hey. we are about to have an extraordinary conversation. I'm yeah. so happy. And I'm going to turn off the comments right now. Okay. And now it's just the two of you, two of I'm us, and a thousand of our closest I'm friends. I'm impressed that you know how to do that because I don't know how to uh, do that. <laughs> oh, it's a really good thing. I mean, I love. I wish we could do both: focus on mm -hmm. each other and hear the comments. But I, I don't have the um, mental skill for that level of <laughs> multitasking. It's hard. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> So everybody, welcome, welcome, Trisha Hersey. Let me just read um, what I've what I've written here about how extraordinary you are, um, so that you can hear it, and we, and you can soak in it for a minute, and everybody else can catch up with who you are. Um, today we're discussing the book "Rest Is Resistance" by Trisha Hersey. Trisha is a multidisciplinary artist, poet, theologian, community organizer, and author of the revolutionary manifesto "Rest Is Resistance," and this is truly truly not just life-changing hopefully potentially cultural cultural changing book mm. she has a bachelor's degree in public health and a master's degree in divinity and you can draw a straight line from her background in both of those fields to her current role as the nap bishop at the helm of the nap ministry <laughs> which upholds the following four sacred tenets one rest is a form of resistance because it disrupts and pushes back against capitalism and white supremacy mm. Mm -hmm. Two, our bodies are a site of liberation. Three, naps provide a portal to imagine, invent, and heal. And four, our dream space has been stolen and we want it back. We will reclaim it by a rest. Yeah. Trisha says that rest is radical, that burnout degrades our divinity. Her work is about deprogramming us individually and as a culture in order to resist the relentless grind. She wants us to break free of the cycle of exhaustion rooted in white supremacy and to take care of our bodies, minds, and spirits. Mm -hmm. Because, as Trisha reminds us, our bodies belong to us, not to a system. And to rest is not just a physical practice, but it allows for imagination to bloom. Mm -hmm. Trisha mm -hmm. preaches that imagination like rest is deeply undervalued in our culture. It's often seen as frivolous or childish or as a way to escape work. Mm -hmm. But she teaches us that daydreaming and sleep dreaming is the work that rest leads to an opening of the dream space, which leads to true liberation and a reckoning with the violence of black oppression. Trisha Hershey, you are amazing and I am so happy to meet you. Oh, oh, what a what an intro. What what's going on with the and did you write that? That is beautiful. I'm I I had some some help with that with my incredible friend Margaret Cordy, who helps run this onward book club with me together this is the work that the two of us are doing to it's try amazing. to celebrate happy to be here I'm so happy that you're here and i want to celebrate you tonight and i i want you to know how extraordinary i think you are and i want everyone to listen to your message um mm -hmm. it's had a huge impact on my life already yeah. um i i have to start by by just saying that you are living what you are preaching and that is not always the case with people no. um you and i know this you've probably met some inspirational people i've met some inspirational people yes. sometimes you're like what you're preaching isn't even working for you you're not even doing it no. you're not even smoking what you're selling no but i can prove that you are living this because i started reaching out to your team in november to try to set a date in the end of january and they could not reach you i could not reach you there was nothing that that I could do to move heaven and earth mm. to get you to focus your attention on me. And I was like, this is amazing. Was, she's actually really off. I was, I, like she's not I, I was in the cave. I went underground. Yeah. You were I love it. gone. Mm -hmm. You were gone from and do you know how hard that is, everybody, to do in this time oh. and age to shut off and deconnect and and get offline enough that you actually literally cannot be reached. No. Um, tell us about that. I know that you were on a sabbatical yeah. and that sabbatical has become an important part of your ministry. So yes. how did you do that? Because I, yeah. I, I want to bow down. Like, how do you do it? It's incredible. That, yeah, I like, 
I do one in November. This is my third year doing one in November. So every November for the last three years, I've done a month offline, a deep technology detox, a full Sabbath. When I think about the idea of a Sabbath and what it means to me, it really means it's a very spiritual practice to say enough has been done. I've done enough. There is things in my power that I can't change right now that um, I trust the universe. I trust the creator to in spirit to move on my behalf to figure things out. I don't have to go, go, go. I can get it going to a dream space. And I, and to me, that is not frivolous. It's not a waste of time. It's actually the work. I wouldn't have been able to birth this book. I wouldn't have been able to start to dream up an idea of resting as resistance in this whole ministry with negative $25 in my account, no car, because I had to sell it to go to graduate school, deeply exhausted, raising a son, financial. I wouldn't have been able to birth an idea like this from an exhausted mind. It, it really did have to come from a place of deep spiritual connection, ancestral practice. It had to be embodied. And that's what this message is. And what it, um, I think why it's taken so much hold on people is that it is not a meme. It is not a fun fact. It is not a real. It is, you will have to lay your as down <laughs> to get this message period there's no step around and you're gonna have to put your laptops down your phones down and you're gonna have to get into true embodiment and so i just knew that from how i began experimenting with the work and so the sabbath is every november i write about it a little bit in my book about how i started it and it was just an experiment could i do this um what how would people react you know what what really i wanted to know is what would come from it i really was interested in what would be revealed when i am disconnected from the voices of hundreds and thousands of people every day beautiful voices some of them really mean horrible voices also but just the idea of hearing noise and sound and the um words of other people I knew somatically, neurologically, spiritually, that that is not something that's going to be good for my own knowing. And so I just really wanted to say, what could happen? What, what would it feel like? And it was very um, interesting to go through it the first time, the first, um, and to watch how people reacted to it. You know, people got really mad. They still do. They get very angry. They don't like a boundary. They don't understand it. They, it's just like, it, it really is um, a way for me to really practice what I preach, but also to do more research into the idea of what grind culture has really done to us. You know, we can talk about it, but to see how it really has embodied and got into us in a bodily way is really fascinating. Can I ask you, did you go through withdrawal when you went off social media? The first time now by this time i'm a pro this is my third year in so it was no it, but the first time i did it there was a little bit of um i would say not withdrawal but more distraction it was like the distraction of what to do something that you do all the time you know the habit of picking up your phone it, it was very embodied it was very much in my body it was like okay pick up my phone scroll get online it's just like that become just part of your but i had to prepare i prepared a lot mentally and i prepared probably for um six months to a year to know that this was going to happen to prepare people around me to get my business in order so that you know because i do run in that ministry and that is um you know a mission statement the thing that we're doing so i had to like prepare people and really make plans for it i wouldn't say withdraw i would say more um i was deeply disturbed by how much of a distraction it was um that i was needing to have in my life that you know because remember i was i was still able to read books you know it wasn't like i was like nah, i could still read books i could still write i wrote like 18 pages of handwritten notes my first time doing one i talk about that in the book how it took me probably like two to three weeks to really settle into it, but I just would go and write. And I would just, the ideas that flooded my mind, I would wake up with these vivid dreams and beautiful poetic lines. I was writing poetry. I was writing sermons. I was just like, you know, it was so much beautiful stuff that came out of it that I, 18 handwritten pages on like the legal pads of just just notes and beautiful ideas that I never would have probably been able to capture because I was online. I was scrolling for hours and hours and hours. So it's incredible.
incredible how I love, um, I mean, I love every one of the tenets of your theory, but number four is the one that moves mm -hmm. my heart. The dream state, dream space has been stolen. Yeah. It's such a, is such a, an exquisite phrase also, um, but it's also true. And I, I have much, much cut back uh, social media because I actually realized, and I love it. I mean, it's a drug that I love. Right. Um, you know, there's a reason people do it. It's because, you know, it, it's programmed to, to reprogram our brains and mm -hmm. to make us want more of it. Oh. And it, and it, and I went off, um, mostly I do this mm -hmm. online and I make announcements online and that's about it anymore. Um, but this idea of the dream space returning, I was in a, not in a block, but I hadn't had an idea for a book in three years. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept asking the universe, which is where I get my ideas. Yeah. I kept writing in my journal every day, is there something that you want me to be working yeah. on? Is there something you want me to be writing? Yeah. And I kept getting this message that said, when we've got something for you to do, you'll be notified. That went <laughs> on for three years. I went off social media. I went, I went through withdrawal. I felt like I was getting off a drug. Mm -hmm. And two Two weeks later, the idea came. Two weeks. And I feel like they couldn't get to oh. me. Yes. They can't, they, yeah. my guides can't find mm -hmm. me when I'm scrolling. Yeah. They can't, I can't hear them. You can't hear it. It's, it's, there is a, it's the antenna has been blocked. You know, the antenna is being just embedded with things all the time. So there's no space to wander, to have your imagination, to just dream, to really like go into a place of just blankness, you know, where you're like, tell me what you want to know. You know, like this antenna, this, you know, the downloads that you receive are brilliant. And so people always say, you know, in the beginning of my, when I started in that ministry um, and was online, people were stealing my work so much i mean it was like no one was crediting me they were literally taking full memes cutting out the nap ministry and putting them up as their own like it was like battles happening and i then i finally thought to myself no one could ever um try to replicate this work because they're too exhausted to do it <laughs> no <laughs> like, like, try, try to steal it you yeah, are still in that ministry. You can't. You're too, you're too stressed. Your antenna is not on. You're too exhausted. You don't rest. Like you, you, this, nothing can come from exhaustion, but more of it. So a rested mind, a, a slowed down state, a, a person who's in a dream space, who's, who's really embodying that. It's, it's like, I'm, it's like you can't catch up, you know, because I've, I'm already open to the antenna. The antenna is open. So the ideas will come. People say, how did you dream up an idea like this? And I said, I was sleeping a lot. I dreamed, I, I dreamed this. You know, this was a dream that came to me. This, my ancestors offered this to me. I was laying on a couch resting all the time. And, and this idea came to me from that. I could have never come from me in an exhausted state. And so I tell people the dream space is the true place of real healing. And the more that we go there, the more we'll wake up. You know, I believe it's a portal. It's another dimension for us. When you speak about your ancestors, there's a line in this book that I think was not just the most moving line for me of the book. And again, everybody, if you're just joining us, we're discussing Rested Resistance, yeah. a, manifesto, a Manifesto by Tricia Hersey. Um, there's a line that moved me and surprised me. One of the best definitions I ever heard of art is that art should be both inevitable and surprising. Mm. When you see it, you're like, oh, right. oh. Like, oh, you know, yeah. and I know that you started the Nat Ministry as an art project. So it makes sense to me that this work feels to me both inevitable and surprising. But mm -hmm. there's a line where you make a promise to your ancestors mm -hmm. and you say, your labor and the theft of your body will not be in vain. I will mm -hmm. rest for you. I've never heard anything like that in my life. What mm -hmm. I've always heard, the way the narrative conventionally goes is, your labor and the theft of your body will not be in vain. I will achieve and succeed for you. I will redeem you by rising to the top of this culture, right? Which mm -hmm. is actually not a redemption no. because all you're doing is accepting the capitalist yes. supremacist culture and then becoming another operator. Yes. But, but to rest and to refuse the culture is yes. the redemption of the ancestors. That... Mm -hmm. I, I get tears again. That's so moving to me. And I wonder if you could, um, if you could talk more about that. Yeah, yeah. That make that's. Thank you, Elizabeth. That means a lot to me. You know, I love your writing. So for uh, that's why I love talking to writers about my book because they can 
really break down what's happening. You know, there's a lot going on in the book that really is going to help people, but I really love when I can get into the technique and what's happening poetically and what, what, what the lines are and what's, what I was trying to do. I really was attempting to um, put people in a trance. I really wanted it to feel like an incantation, a lullaby, a prayer. And so when I think of my ancestors, I, I wrote this piece saying, um, someone must rest for you. You know, we will be resurrected in our dreams. You know, I will do it. I will be the one who will reclaim the, the dream space that was stolen for you. Let me be the reclaimer. Let me be the, the debt collector. You know, let me be the one who will in some way be able to connect with you there. You know, I, I, you're gone now. You're out of this dimension, but you're still an ancestor. So I believe you um you're never gone and so the dream space and the sleeping and the resting and the connecting with them came as a way when i was thinking about i want to be reconnected with them i want to rest with them i want to rest for them i want to be in this dream space with them let's let's go meet there you know let's let's resurrect you there let's go be resurrected sp spiritually there you know and so it was so important that i um I think about that because that was the reason I did the work. And I was having these deep dreams with my grandmother, Aura, who's the muse of this work, who I talk about all the time. I have a picture of her. Can we see her? Whose Aura. name? I looked up her name. Her name means prayer or incantation or oracle. Like, there she is. And she's the one who, as hard as she worked, she was the one who said, I rest my eyes. Every day. Every day uh -huh. for 30 minutes. And you thought she was napping, but she said, no, this is where I'm this is where I'm, I'm she was in her antenna I'm this is where I'm pulling down divination she would say I'm listening what the universe is telling me sometimes she would say I'm listening to God I'm listening I'm every shot I ain't sleep I'm resting my eyes I'm listening and so wow to think of what she was going through and 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 her to reclaim her space like that raising eight children my mother is one of eight children and um, I'm one of her dozens of dozens of grandchildren. And so like, she was the matriarch of the family and she was my favorite. She always told me I was her favorite. I was sitting on the couch next to her and take naps with her. And, <laughs> you know, like we're so in love. And um, she died when I was like 12, 13 years old. So, but I just remember her deeply sleeping like that and resting, well, not sleeping, resting her eyes, listening. This, what was she so you know i always i wonder to like what was what downloads was she getting that would allow her to continue on in her life and to all that she was dealing with to be able to make it and so to be able to really embody a, a real beautiful life so she might have been just envisioning you doing mm. this for thousands of people like when it, it feels like such an act of destiny and almost like a premonition yeah. you know, that you have this memory of being in deep rest with a woman who you loved and trusted yes. snuggled on the couch and now this is what you give people mm -hmm. like that you mm -hmm. created the nap ministry can you talk to us about the the first time mm -hmm. that you did a public napping yeah. like this is this is the magic of trisha hersey so could you just explain like how you created what you did in atlanta that yeah. first time yeah that's a great question no one's ever asked me that so i really do love to talk about it. i love to talk about the community work, like what this work really came from. So many people think it's the um, IG page. And what's funny is that all the social media came after my friend. I was doing all this work in Atlanta and one of my friends, this is how naive I was to like trying to have this be this thing. And my friend was like, you know what? Why don't you just like grab the net ministry that work on online? Why don't you just, if you don't do anything with them, just capture it on Instagram, on Twitter. I was like, you think so? She was like, girl, yeah, just, you ain't got to post nothing, but just get it. I was like, okay. So we were already doing this work for years. And so the first one, people, people knew what I was studying. They knew I was out of school. I was finished up seminary at Emory and they knew that I was, whenever somebody would talk to me, like, what are you working on now? I mean, because everyone thought that I would be being ordained and I would go on to like lead a church. Like most of my friends are, I was trained as a pastor. I just never knew I never wanted to work in, um, in churches. I just knew I wanted to do something with the community, something art centered. What are you working on? I'd be like, I'm thinking about this thing with rest and the naps. And most people would laugh and think I was joking, but it was like three or four people who was like, that's brilliant. Like I'm, they're like crying when I'm telling them about it. So I didn't know how I would do this. I didn't have a dime. I literally had like negative $25 in my account. I was right out of graduate school trying to go on interviews to get a job as a chaplain. 
nobody would hire me. But Elizabeth, what's so funny is every interview I went on, I was literally having spiritual direction chaplaincy sessions with the interviewer. (laughs) (laughs) And two of them, they told me, they were crying and telling me about this thing they were going through. Their daughter was like going through addiction and something else was happening. We were like, they were walking me to the car. Like they were loving me so much. And I was like counseling them. And then they didn't hire me. (laughs) So, so, (laughs) So... I'm like, my husband was like, that's not your job. That's why you, your job is this ministry. Keep doing it. I was like, but I don't get paid any money. What do you mean? He was like, just keep doing it. So word got around that um, I could use the space for free. I was like, if I can use it for free, I'm, I'm going to do this whole idea. I, my idea was a one night only thing. I would, one night only, I would present this idea that I was working on called um, Transfiguration, which was really me looking at the archive, you know, because I was in the archives in school working as an archivist and really me putting together kind of like a thesis presentation of everything I learned over four years in seminary, everything I learned as a poet. I was like uplifting this idea of the NAP ministry of rest as resistance and reparation. So we built this beautiful altar and pillows and blankets and I just told people I'm going to be doing it down here one night, come out. I did this whole performance art piece of me reading archival documents. And I had like raw cotton, you know, I had real raw cotton that I was like laying out. It was just like this really art based piece. And I told some people to come. It's always going to be my family because they just support every, you know, shenanigan I'm into. If it's an art thing, like I'm going to be there. <laughs> so I was like, maybe my family will come and that'll be cool. It'll be like 10 people. And I guess word got out um, to like a local paper here and 40 people came. One lady drove like two hours. She was like, is this where I come to lay down? Is this where we go to rest? I said, yeah. Is she didn't even say hi. Right. She, I come to rest. Lay down. Yeah. she was like, where? I was like, okay, go take off your shoes. Here's a pillow. It was like, I heard that I can come and sleep here. I was like, you can. And so 40 people came. We had this beautiful room. And they rested for two hours. I could not wake people up. We had like a soundscape of music. We had a beautiful altar and teas for people to drink that were like healing, pillows, blankets. And I woke people up to do a nap talk with them. So it was kind of like a TED talk, but it was like, we're going to talk about the tennis. It was like me just really like out here on the road, you know, preaching the message. We had this beautiful board up with all the tennis on it and asking people what did they experience while they were sleeping. That's such the beautiful part. Every single time we have an event, we wake people up and we ask them, what did you experience? What, were you, what, was, what did you discover? Did you rest? Did you sleep? And every single person just begins to be so emotional and talk about they never have slept in 10 years. They haven't had a nap. They're so exhausted. They didn't realize how exhausted they were. They feel like they had a dream where their grandmother came and visited them. It's always such beautiful spiritual things that happen that really move people. So we hold space for everyone to rest and ask questions and kind of begin to process. And then, so it's like all the practice of like really sleeping, resting. And then we're going to talk about it and hold space for people to like share. What was it like to, to do that in public with people? I thought no one would come. I thought no one would certainly leave their purse and their cell phones and like sleep around a strange woman. Like, who is this lady? Like, you know, like who's going to sleep around strangers they don't know? That's such a vulnerable place to just, here's a yoga mat and a pillow and some blankets, go lay down. It's like this huge sea of people's resting. But I couldn't wake people. People were coming like, well, you know, I really don't like nap, and, but I'm just going to come and support you. And they will sleep for 45 minutes straight. <laughs> Yeah, because everybody is sleep deprived and everybody is sleep sick in this culture. They just don't, we don't know it because our nervous systems are trained to believe that that's just what life feels like. Um, Because, you know, as you said, even pre-birth, you know, I've I've heard you say that like the grind is starting. Your your son having to be born by cesarean section section at the convenience of the doctor who was going to be, this is the time slot, you know, in which you can be born. Like everything is in this time slot. I, I was struck that to me, you know, I always think of rest as something so solitary. And mm. um, what do you think is the, wh- why did you find that it was so important, yeah. even sacred, to do this communal resting? What do you think happens when people rest yeah. in a group yeah. that can't happen when you're it, just it, by yourself it, on the couch? It had to be communal and community. It had to be like, I began experimenting with it on my own self. It was just me on the couch at home just seeing what could this happen. But once I began to see what it was doing to me, 
I think it's because of my training as a community activist. You know, my dad was a community activist. I've been an organizer, trained, um, working in community since I was 18 years old. And so I went to seminary already working as an activist. I just wanted to go there and really ground my work. So I knew that this had to be shared. I also know that we nothing, no healing happens alone. And this is indigenous. Indigenous um, communities know this. Black folks know this. We will not heal alone. It takes a village. Individualism is the death cult. Nothing can happen by ourselves. We have to be together and in community. So I've always been deeply understanding and knowing that community is the way that will save us. Community care will always save us. Like I, I've witnessed that my whole life. My dad was a union organizer. He was a community activist, preacher. It everything happens with each other. So I was like, I have to share this. And I also wanted people to rest together because I wanted to see what would happen when people are in a big room together sleeping, what 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 could go on? And I and what really has started to happen is people sync up, their bodies and their breathing syncs up. Um, this beautiful story I have to tell you. When I was in Chicago, I did an event at a beautiful art gallery called Root Work Gallery. Um, Tracy Hall owns it, and upstairs this beautiful art gallery and in her basement. She's like, you can use the basement. So we just made the basement like this whole rest area. We could fit about 50 people in there. And so we had 50 people crammed on the floor in the basement of this art gallery on, in Chicago. And um, I did this whole rest thing. I did the Transfiguration archival piece. And then we all slept together. People woke up. And this, I said, share your stories. What happened? So this woman started telling us about her dream. She said, I was drink, I dreamt that I was on a boat. And she just began to give us all the details of the boat. And then I see a woman who's way in the back. She starts crying. I'm like, do you want to share what's happening? What's up? You know, she was like, I had the same dream. So no. yes, I said, pick up the dream. So she begins to pick up the dream. And the woman in front was like, that's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. So yes. <laughs> Absolutely. People, yes. They have the exact same dream. She was like, what color dress? She was like, I had a blue dress. No. Yes. It was that she had she just was bawling. She was like, I had the same dream. And so studies around this is I know the breathing syncs up. I know people who rest together, they they're breathing and they begin to sync up, but to have the same dreams, that for the dreams to connect in this way that we're like connecting together, it was beautiful. Show me. It's 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 spiritual work. It's spiritual work. It really is. It's, it's spiritual work. work, and yeah, that's why this intersection of you and your your your, you know, you're you're the perfect person to do this as as mm -hmm. a poet, as an artist, as a community activist, yes. as a pastor. Mm -hmm. Like, it had to be you who literally dreamt this up, and as mm -hmm. as somebody who's happiest moments for napping with her yeah. grandmother on the couch, like it all yeah, comes together all, in that all, basement. Yeah. Um, yes. So I, you know, the more I hear about the true magic, the divinity of it, the yeah. sacredness of it, the more my soul feels appalled mm. Um, mm. That, that this culture yeah. is so contemptuous of mm. rest. Yes. Um, and you write that the concept of laziness is a tool of the oppressor. Um, you wrote that grind culture is a collaboration between white supremacy and capitalism using bodies as tools. So much of what you're talking about is about remembering what the body yes. is. That it is this encasement of the divine. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I found so moving is when you do your nap ministries, you walk through the room and you say things to people like, thank you for living. Yes. Um, and and how insulting to that divinity. Mm -hmm. um, it's an, it, how degrading and insulting yeah. to that divinity to yeah. look at a human body and try to figure out how much productivity you can get out of it. Um, and how dreadful yeah. that that was done to people and that now it's been internalized yeah. so that we only know our worth by how much we produce. Yes. Um, what, an, what an absolute, it's, I can't, it's, my soul is appalled. That's all I can say. It, my soul is appalled. <laughs> it's so rage. I talk about the rage, the tender rage. Like I am disgusted. It is so violent. To, 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 like you said it so beautifully, to take a human divine body 
who comes to this earth, you know, comes here already worthy and already having what they need and to say, okay, you have to now prove yourself and your the beauty of who you are based on how much you can get done, based on how much you can push others, based on how much, you know, capitalism says you can. And then when you think about white supremacy and what it's said and done about to bodies and how it's used bodies as really to not even see a body as a human, you know, it's just taking away the full humanity, not even see it as an animal. When I think of the, you know, transatlantic slave trade and chattel slavery, what that upheld and what that allowed people to get sick from, to think that a, a human body, how divine it is, how it's this site of true liberation. Instead, we've said, what, what can I do? How much can I get done? And now I'm okay. Now I'm worried. And so it really is deep. If you really sit and think about it, <laughs> like if you really, it, it's deep, 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 like violent, like rage inducing heavy work. You know what I mean? And so I think people are not, when they begin to finally pull back that veil a little and see what really it is and what it's saying about them, that's the resistance. That's where it's like, okay, now you're right. Let's, let's not, let's be, let's refuse. Let's have a politics of refusal around this, you know? A politics of refusal mm. requires dropping many things, including um, something that I've been railing against for a very long time, which is um, purpose theology. Um, mm. uh, this, 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 this idea that you, you, it's, it's cased in a lot of stuff that sounds good and inspirational, but it's actually so horrific. Yeah. Um, like you have a, you each have a unique purpose that, and you come here and your job, it's already a job, it's already your job, it's already a job. Your job is to uncover what that purpose is. Already and then once you've discovered what it is, you have to become the master yeah. of it. You've got to become the very best of it. Yeah. Then you have to monetize oh, it. That's the then it's not enough to monetize it. You have to leave a legacy. Oh my God. Of course, our, our rancid individualism means that you have to make an impact. And if you haven't made an impact on the world, you haven't really been here. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know anybody who doesn't suffer from purpose anxiety. And all it is, 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 is grind, is grind culture. It's so um, thick. It's, it's such so a program. <laughs> It's such a brainwash. It's such a brainwash. I keep telling people, you did not, be, you're not born to come on this earth to just be trying to do things all the time. Like that is not why you were born. I didn't, I didn't yeah. birth my son. So they, I didn't go through labor and the beauty of being, you know, carrying him in my womb and wanting him and bringing him to the world so that he can just be here to be some tool for an empire that hates him. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Him. He's a black boy in America. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? like? Why? That doesn't make any sense. Like I, I, he is here and he is born to to live, to explore, mm -hmm. to be, to stare at a tree, to rest, to um, to to find, to get into whatever his heart feels good. You know, oh, like to have pleasure. How about that? You know how? How about, how about that? Pleasure? You know, like. I, you know, how about it doesn't have to come after we work, like work hard, play hard. And what if he was just born simply to have pleasure and to explore and to just, you know, be alive and to love? Like, what is, why is that not enough? And so, yeah, it's it's, it's a total disregard. Um, it's a total degradation. It's, it's degradation. It's total disregard. And it's the, one of the most violent things that I've really seen this, I mean, this culture has done a lot of things, but when you think about how it has twisted our minds around the idea of something that we can't live without, like without sleep, without rest, like we literally are killing ourselves. I tell the story of my dad, you know, and you watch people in a sleep deprivation being a health issue. This is not no joke. This is life or death type stuff. And I just want people when they begin to unravel and I knew I was on to something when I started telling people about what I was doing, they would start bawling. And I was like, I got them, you know? <laughs> people just, like, I got them. Like, yes, <laughs> let it out. Like, you have been tricked. You, you been are enough duped. now. You, you are, been up, duped. are worthy and, of care, you know? And, the, and, and the, of course, as in all things, right, the bulk of the punishment is on, is on black and brown people. Yes. Um, in order for me to build, order something from Amazon and have it be delivered the next day, somebody's packing it and shipping it at two o'clock in the morning. And that's, okay. you know, that, that's a class issue. That's a race yes. issue. 
um, and their kids aren't getting their love. They're not getting the sleep that they need. It's, it's brutal. Um, it's brutal. I, I, I want to say um, there's this moment on page 28, and you get into this a couple of times in the book where you discuss the concept of rest as a privilege. Yeah. Um, because I, I know this is something people bring to you a lot where they're like, well, must be nice. They know. <laughs> must be nice. <laughs> must be nice. <laughs> must, must be nice. Wish I could take a nap. You know, like, like what, yeah. what do you mean? Like, I don't have to work. Like, I, I will be homeless if I stop working today. Like, what do you mean? I'm a black woman. I will <laughs> die if I stop working. And, and you write, if I may read, it, it's so beautiful. You say, you are worthy of rest. We don't have to earn rest. Rest is not a luxury, a privilege, or a bonus we must wait for once we are burned out. I hear so many repeat the myth of rest being a privilege, and I understand this concept and still deeply disagree with it. <laughs> rest is not a privilege because our bodies are still our own, no matter what the current systems teach us. The more we think of rest as a luxury, the more we buy into the systemic lies of grind culture. Trisha Hersey. <laughs> I mean. I did. I, I I dragged it. I didn't have, I didn't leave nothing on. I just said, I'm going in. <laughs> if this is my one book, I'm going in. <laughs> and how, and, and yet, oh, there's another thing I want to say. I wanted, I wanted to find rest. Sorry. I, I, there's so many things I want to say all at the same time, but there's, you have a, a wonderful thing here that ties into this. I thought I memorized what page it's on. Hang on. Everybody rest. Everybody rest for a minute. Take while a I moment. find this. Um, you talk about, here it is, hang on, page 148. Mm -hmm. um, how you can resist the constant pull of grind culture. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is what you write. You write, rest looks like tapping in and listening to what your body and soul wants. It's extra time while bathing, even an extra 10 minutes of concentrated silence. Mm -hmm. Rest is taking a leisurely walk and dancing. Rest is a tea ritual, allowing you to meditate while breathing in each warm sip. Rest is not returning an email immediately and maintaining healthy boundaries. Rest is honoring the boundaries of those you engage with, rejecting urgency. Rest is detoxing from social media. Rest is listening and healing from individual trauma. Rest is journaling so you can be a witness to your own inner knowing without the energy of others. Rest uplifts and boosts our spirit, allowing us to know that we are enough and the care of our souls deserves a role in our healing plan. Mm. This was a really important thing for me because you are the NAP Bishop and because you're, you are known as the NAP Ministry, I think I had a misunderstanding that you were only talking about sleep. Yes. Um, your reframing I of rest is beautiful here. And I wonder if you can say more about how you came to realize that yeah. what else rest is. Yeah. yeah, I did that on purpose. I named it intentionally as the NAP. I, I wanted it to be called the NAP ministry. I wanted people to, and, and I'm a performance artist. So, you know, remember, I'd like to do, I like to be a trickster <laughs> and I like to do um, things like that. And so I always do a lot of persona work. And so even before I was the Nat Bishop, I was another persona. So my theater, my performance kind of like practice is like creating these personas to embody these um, ideas. And so the Nat Bishop I always wanted to kind of blur the lines between is this secular is she is this church and so growing up in the black church there was always a ministry you know the um the um food ministry of women who would come to the church and cook with my mother in the mornings you know like um the children's ministry you know it was always everybody had a role in this ministry of like running and um this whole church and running this community so i thought about the idea of a net ministry like i thought how cool that would be to like really up and kind of play around with the idea of a bishop and this woman presiding over the people. And so it really is full. It's an art project. It's really in a lot of ways it has that, um, that art um, vibe to it, that trickster vibe, that playful vibe, then I bring you in. And so people would come onto the page and be like, oh my goodness, she is so funny, the nap bishop, she's dressed so cute. And it's about laying down, it's about a nap. And I'll be like, down with white supremacy and capitalism. <laughs> and you are, I was just like going in on all these politics and be like, wait a minute. So I love that playfulness and like turning this on its head that, wait a minute, I thought this was about something else, but she's literally talking about the transatlantic slave Slave trade and slavery and and like why I need Here to like is what we call a bran muffin frosted to look like a cupcake yeah. <laughs> yeah. and a that is one of the smartest things you can do 
with it. I wanted I wanted to play around with the, the trickster element of it and get people thinking and reframing it and having them come along with me on it and having because this work is really about experimentation and and, and I talk about the book uh, people are going to continue to expand on this work um and that um I needed to say naps the nap ministry and then to me resting is so much more like the idea of resting is infinite you know it's this reimagination it's really about the imagination space and being in, and thinking about what it means to imagine and how we can kind of dream ourselves free and how connecting so this work is really about connecting and slowing down and community i say community care so much in the book i don't mention self-care once in the book fifty-five thousand words i did that on purpose <laughs> community care i will not say self-care i'm all about community communal we have to do this together hmm. i everything that begins I've, I've heard heard recently everything that begins with self is ego and everything that's ego is mm -hmm is white supremacy mm -hmm. and capitalism so self-made yes you know, no such thing like <laughs> no self no <laughs> you, you, can, you know. like to think it you know self-care it's like no we need each oh, other right. you know um yeah at yeah. all it's it's yeah it's yeah you're flipping it all it's amazing okay you keep using one of my favorite words um trickster yes um and and i'm wondering if you can talk about the trickster paradigm because um, it's the, to me, the trickster has always been the antidote, the opposite of the martyr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so mm -hmm. the martyr is, I will die broken by this system and my body, my broken body will be the evidence of how hard I try. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I will sacrifice my life yes. for this. The, the trickster's like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'll live actually yes i will survive everything yeah um, and and i will find joy and i will subvert yes. and so i'm not going to become the martyr to this system i'm i'm going to subvert it mm -hmm. and i'm going to find joy in it i'm yeah. going to make play in it yes. and i'm going to flip it yeah. um and that's and and i think sometimes i i ask myself often is it possible to be a healthy person in this deeply unhealthy culture and i think the ways that you're doing it are right. You can do it through community. You mm -hmm. got to build your own. You have to build your own culture, yeah. subculture inside yeah. of the culture, yeah. and and you can do it as an artist and as a woman if you're a trickster. Yes. Um, yes. Which means, like, you got to be tricky. <laughs> no, I <laughs> can't let them I, catch you. So yeah, this, I'm wondering if you can talk about what trickster means to you because I every time you say it, like my tail gets all bushy, my ears go up, I get like very excited. I love it. I love what you're saying about the martyr tricks like they're the reverse. I The trickster concept gives a beautiful segue for us to talk about the American Maroons. Did you yes. read about the Maroons? Yes. <laughs> in my notes to talk about yes. it because they, I was like, they, so many questions about this. They are the tricksters. That's who Original. I, um, Harriet Tubman, the um, American Maroons, my grandmother, my, the, my ancestors, known and unknown, who were subverting in sub the system. When I think about what they were doing and so when I think about the idea of a trickster I love what you said like no I'm going to survive I'm going to um tell you one thing but do another I'm going to create a temporary space of joy and freedom I'm going to create a third space I talk a lot about the third space how resting is a third space like people keep asking me well how can I do this like this this sounds nice they just get so overwhelmed and desperate and I understand the desperation and I keep trying to tell them what my grandmother told me you have to be in this world, but not of this world. That's the trickster right there to say, oh yeah, I live here. I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. You know, that's what the Maroon said. The Maroon said, oh, you think I'm gonna Can be- Can you tell everybody, back up and just tell everybody who doesn't know what the Maroons were yeah. and what their history was? Yeah. And, yeah. I love that I love that I was able to get it in the book in that in the back of the book in the library the Nat Ministry Library the bibliography I list this book that I think everyone needs to read Slavery's Exiles the story of the American Maroons is deeply researched by an amazing brilliant um researcher the American Maroons were enslaved Africans who were jumping off of slave ships who were running off plantations who were not fugitives I think that's the key that people always think about the runaways and the fugitives they never claimed or saw themselves as fugitives. They were all time.
anonymous. They were living in caves. They were living underground in trees. They were leaving the plantation, just walking off, never to be found again. Some were 15 years. They were living, having full communities, babies, having systems. It was like a full community. They were like living outside of the system. So the plantation would be here and they might be 100 feet away in the bush and no one ever found them. And so they were these maroons, these people who marooned and said that uh, I'm free. I don't know what y'all got going on. I know there's this thing called slavery happening and you're doing this thing, but that's not of me. I'm not of that. I'm going to go and create my a third space, another space. I'm going to go live outside the confines. I'm going to create um, a new reality, a new system. And so they are my I mean, they are my guys. Like, I, can, I can't even imagine the things that they were doing. I think about my grandmother and also the people of the Great Migration, you know, people leaving the racial terror of the Deep South with, like, pockets, like, you know, things stuck in their pocket of where they thought their aunt might live on the South Side when they got there, taking buses with $2 and hoping that they would land. Like, they, my grandmother told me she left Mississippi because she had saw a lynching, and she would never see another one in her life. Mm -hmm. And so she got on a bus and came to Chicago, like millions of other Black Americans, full refugee, running from racial terror, and created and built this spaceship, you know, of this uncertainty, folded <laughs> their ways to the North and to the West. Like, I'm just so enamored by them. I'm so in love with the idea of people resisting in that deep of a way, resisting with so much ease to say, you can do that, but I'm going to do this. And so that to me is the trickster. The trickster is saying, I'm going to be subversive. I'm going to be flexible. I'm going to invent. I'm going to deep, deep, deeply go into my imagination. And, you know, so imagine is like a whole part of the book because I talk about the idea of what imagination can do for us. So they're imaginative, um, subversive geniuses, really. That's who the Maroons are. <laughs> I love this. I get so excited. Like, I'm just thinking about the animals um, in, in, in various cultures that represent trickster. Because yes. it's, a, it's a figure that shows up in every culture. Mm -hmm. It's essential. Yeah. Um, because somebody has to be subverting totalitarianism, essentially, mm -hmm. in every culture. Because totalitarianism always wants to rise, right? Oh. And the trickster's like, no, no, you can't have me. Like, you can do your yeah. thing, but you can't have me. So it's the, it's the, it's the rabbit. Um, mm -hmm. In African culture, it's the oh, it's the it. monkey in in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. It's yeah. the fox yeah. um, in Europe. It's like you can't you you know I'm not going to let you. You can't get me. You can't take me. I love um, and I remember doing research once on 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 the tr the rabbit trickster god. I got really fascinated yeah. with that, and I was mm -hmm. and I was looking into it, and and I found this amazing website that was like it was a chart about all the world's gods. I, I was so nerding out on it and it had different categories yeah. in it. So like what the God was, what was their gender if yeah. they had one? What was their power if they yeah. had one? What was their morality? No. Were they good? Were they evil? I got down to the trickster gods and it said, and they were talking about specifically um, the, the, the African rabbit trickster god that yeah. was brought to was brought to the new world. Um, and, and it said morality so it's like you know here's where it comes from first signs here this is the part of the world that it comes from mm -hmm. and then it says morality usually they say good or evil yes and it says maybe doesn't care that's what it <laughs> says maybe <laughs> doesn't care i love it oh my gosh maybe doesn't it. care and that's what i think is the most subversive thing because Mm -hmm. Fuck this culture yes. for making productivity into a moral question. So that if you are not productive enough, you are looked upon as being immoral. Yes. Um, like, and and all of the things that go along with it. Frugality is a moral yeah. question. Yeah. You know, like, like how productive are you? How efficient are you? All of they these things it. have become morality. All so that you can be shamed into having to to be in that box which yep. only makes the machine work better. Yep. And so the idea of a trickster God who looks at that morality and says, maybe doesn't care. <laughs> I, it doesn't have to do with me. Like, I don't, I don't abide by that. I don't, I'm not of this world. I'm just, I, I'm here, but I don't abide by that. That's not what I follow. That's what I tell people when they're like, how do I do this work? You're going to have to like begin to deepen into that mode. And it's going to take a lifetime.
and I wish I want people to understand this, this unraveling is going to take a lifetime. You tapping in is going to it's a and I, I'm grateful for the lifetime. I want it to take a lifetime. I don't need the rush. This isn't no self help crap. Ten ways to do something after you do the team. <laughs> good like no this is like full on unraveling deprogramming ancient like healing work and so I give thanks that it's going to take a lifetime for us to be able to begin to subvert these systems and tap into our dream space and reclaim our bodies to say you can't have me you won't get me I'm not one you know like I won't go like it's not going to be me dying from exhaustion and not being able to tap into pleasure and rest and connection while i'm here on this earth in this dimension like no this period no <laughs> i feel like i have actual love beaming out of me like my my face can't contain mm. the amount of love that i'm feeling for you right now and awe i'm just like beam, mm -hmm. like gold beams of love mm -hmm. everything just i want to punctuate every single thing that you're saying and i i, I there's a line in the book that I also love. You, you wrote, I know that I was not born to exhaust myself inside a violent system. Mm -mm. I, I know that I was not born to exhaust myself inside a violent no. system. No. This to me brings up a concept that I wanted to talk to you about, about what I call capital K knowing, Ooh. Um, which is different from what you learn, um, you know, what you your, what you know what you've yeah. been taught yes um you know what you go into and you take down academia very nicely in this book too as a, as a big tool of, of grind culture like people kids dying in the library yeah. trying to do you know trying to be stuffed filled with with information right? yeah um and yet knowing is, is something that you talk about in this book a lot and it's important to me too what you know intuitively yeah, yeah. um what you what you don't need anybody to tell you to know no. what nobody can take away from you right. that you know yes. um, and you can't access knowing from a place of exhaustion no. and grind in fact that's probably one of the tricks that's of the grind is to prevent you from knowing. absolutely <laughs> capital capital k knowing the wisdom the innate wisdom yep. the eavesdropping on the cosmic mind hearing messages that only you can hear um and i would love to hear about how old you were yeah. when you began to know that you knew things? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I talk because you are, I tell you are a mystic. You know this already, but you are I, a mystic. I, 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 people have, I slowly am accepting some things about myself. I'll say that. <laughs> I think my grand, I talk about my grandmother in a book. Do you remember the story um, where I talk about her talking about um, she's driving me and we go past the cemetery and she's like, I'm like, oh, you know, the dead are wonderful. To be was around. Like, They're the best. We love like, the dead. Don't worry about them. <laughs> like, keep your eyes on the living. You know, those those aren't the ones you got to worry about. Because I was like, oh, I'm scared to drive past. She's like, don't be scared of them. Like, spirits are all around us. You know, spirits are all around us. They're here to protect us. You know, she always would say that. And I think I was probably eight years old when I used to hang out with her a lot. And when I would just sit on the porch. And then my grand. Don't also forget my dad and my mom. My dad was a pastor of a Pentecostal black church. I grew up in that Pentecostal black church my entire life. And so I talk about that experience too. And I think growing up in the black church in, in, in a specific denomination, Pentecostalism, where leaping between spirit and embodying the Holy Ghost and like all of that stuff is like, that, that comes easy. You know, I, I can, I could make a leap to that just because I was raised knowing that my dad would tell me you were born um, because you were born to be divine because God wanted you to be divine. And your body, your blackness, your womanness is not um, a criminal curse. It's actually the deepest blessing. And so I think the black church really um, put, I was raised, my mother went into labor with me in church. So when I say I was raised in the black church, like she went to Sunday school and then she went to go have the baby and then brought me right back to the church. So. <laughs> It's ideas around spirituality and it's ideas around divinity and black liberation and um, the idea of like we're here in the now, but we're not of this world, that there's a deeper connection to things. And also their brilliant embodiment. You know, I would remember being seven, eight years old, watching people catch the Holy Ghost and pass out on the floor and 
wake up and they literally look different. Like I saw people be healed from drug addiction and healed from things. And I, I loved watching it. Like my other people in my family, all of my sisters and brothers and other kids, they would be afraid of it. They would be scared when it would happen. And I literally would be mad when someone didn't catch the Holy Ghost. And I would tell my mother, why did it happen today? She was like, it's not a bad, like, I would be like, when is that going to happen? I'm scared. You know, she's like, you're, you know, it was like so beautiful to watch mm -hmm. some people be to transform in their bodies and for them to just like give way to the spirit and I love I would stand up on top of the pews and look over at the people when they were laid out with the white things over them and I loved it my mother was like you can't make it happen I used to be like why did it happen today like I love why she's like you can't make it happen child like, <laughs> it, you know, <laughs> like listen we've only got another half an hour here this like, isn't a theater oh yeah she was so <laughs> like, it's like it's gonna when it moves I was always taught that things move and you need to make space for things to spirit to be here so from a very early age I was raised um with that type of um worship and that type of like connection to a higher thing amazing yeah. I just I just love your impatience like come on holy spirit let's go let's go <laughs> <laughs> And they will cover their face and be kind of freaked out by it. And I will be like, okay, we, it's been a happen. Like, that, you're like, ah! popcorn, yes. like right in the front row. I love the, the theater of it, the embodiment. The greatest show. Started. Well, listen, you know, you keep talking about like, you know, art and divinity in my mind are not different things. No. Like, you know, that's another thing our culture has done is separate yeah. those things out, monetize them, professionalize both of them. Sure. You know, but like art is divinity. It always has always. been. Always. Um, you know, so to me, it makes perfect sense mm -hmm. that, 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 that you come from, it doesn't even make sense to me to say both of those backgrounds. It's the same, same background. Yeah. Art. Yeah, it's um, art. I love your idea of creating a not to do list yes. instead of a to do list. Okay. Um, talk about trickster, talk about like subversion. Love. Can you, can you tell us, give us an example of what's on your not to do list right now? Yeah. My um, one of the top things on my not to do list, I will never have um um no meetings for an hour. All my meetings have to be 30 minutes. Anybody coming to my inbox wanting to do some meeting, some cold email to talk about something, don't schedule that Zoom. It has 30 minutes only. Hmm. <laughs> if we can spread out in 30 minutes, we can be concise and prepared, then it's not for me. You know, we're gonna do 30 minutes and move on and go meditate on it and telepathically communicate and get back to each other on it, you know. Wow. That's um, all my, I don't one do of the things that's on my not to do list yeah. was not to have a child. And, um, and I thought about a lot, a lot while I was reading this, because again and again and again, you emphasize your body belongs to you and the guilt and shame that I went through as a 30 year old woman, deciding that I wasn't going to have a mm -hmm. child and feeling like I, I had this sense that I was letting down, like I was, I was, I was supposed to provide a child yeah. to this culture. Girl. Like it was my job. And, and, and like, that's a job that I've, that I've decided not to do. I love, um, and I love that. And that, but it took, it wasn't, it, it, I, I bled tears in that because I felt like I was breaking some sort of a rule yeah. that you're, you know, that you're, ha that you have to do this thing. And if you don't do this thing, you're not contributing. Yeah. <laughs> Is, is, a, is a full demon as well so it think, makes us believe that we're not you're not woman enough and you haven't done enough because you didn't have a child and I, I mean yeah all of the things when I talk about everything is in collaboration for us to hate ourselves for us to not love ourselves for us to not rest for us to be um, a tool for the for this empire every when I say everything I'm not being like dramatic like everything in the system is doing that to us so the more that we can slow down enough to peel back and to look in and to like see what's really going on like I feel like this work is a veil buster it, it, it busts and removes veils you know it kind of pulls it back and I just want you to just pull it back a little bit and be like oh, wait wait a minute wait you a know minute. I've been <laughs> you know, wait a and if, if you can do that then the work is already starting and you're going to begin to begin to deepen into the facts people have always told me until you said that it was okay for me to take a nap i thought i could never do that i never saw it like this and so i i, I want this work to be a a veil buster remove a veil pull back up something on someone's eye open up something so that they can begin to tap into who they really truly are like once someone knows that it's over for the systems once we really know who we are <laughs> they're done it's 
So I really hope that resting and slowing down and connecting will allow people to deepen into to their humanness. This work is about being human. It's really full on um, work about connecting us to that human place. So if I'm, anybody asks me what this work is about, Elevator Pitch, it's the Map Ministry is about helping us to be more human. I am so respectful of your time more than anyone's. This yeah. has been an hour. <laughs> I don't want to let you go. Oh, great. I, love I don't it. want to let you go, but I like. I also am like, you can't hold Trisha for have- a more time. Yeah, <laughs> I love. I love talking with you. It's been such. I'm learning so much, and I love talking with you. We have to talk again. Like this can't be the last time. Hmm. I, there's two. Do, do you have? Can I ask you yes. one more question and then close on one thing? Okay. Yes. Just for a minute, can you talk about the wellness industry and the self care industry? Can we just? Can you just? <laughs> Can you just do what needs to be done in that regard yes. and how that is not the rest revolution? No, no, the wellness industry is nothing but just just capitalism package. So the more that we can begin to say that this is about, it's, it's consumerist, it's capitalism, it's an extension of capitalism. I get so upset when people say that this is, my work is a wellness work. When people are like, oh, we, we doing, I'm like, this isn't wellness work. Like I'm not, I'm not a wellness leader. I'm literally... A activist. This is like political resistance work. This is social justice work. And so the wellness industry to me is pretty much demons. <laughs> like what they are doing to people, making them think that they have to pay. I've been seeing so many things being the pricing of things, the commodification of it, the way they're packaging, like you said, monetizing ancient work, you know, the way they're doing that, it just makes me sick. And I just get so sad that people have been like bamboozled by it, that they have believed that they can buy their way to um, wellness. And, and but also what makes me mad about the wellness industry, they never, ever, ever uplift the systems that are making us unwell. Why are we unwell? <laughs> why, why? Why don't y'all uplift the fact that patriarchy, capitalism, white supremacy, ableism, all these things are making us deeply unwell. Instead, you, it's made to feel that you're a bit, that you, it's your fault that you're unwell. You, if you can just buy more things more, you'll be better. You can just go goals, get set more goals, set more, set more inspiration. Goals, yeah, have yeah. your planner together, do more vision boards. Get that vision board done. Yeah. Do more <laughs> way, do this, work out more, get up early. If you can just do those things, you will be well. And I'm saying like, why don't y'all uplift why, pe- why this nation is so sick and why everyone is so unwell and so like spiritually disconnected and physically unwell as well because no one wants to call out and illuminate the people who are doing this. Like we have, if you're not talking about anything that is illumin- illuminating systems, then it's, un- it's incomplete wellness work. I say that in the book. I write that in the book. I say, if you are, you're simply just an agent of grind culture. I call people agents of grind culture. Anyone who is uplifting a wellness message and isn't talking about the systems that are making us unwell, run. Oh, they're just another system that's going to keep continue to like ignore justice work and ignore what really can help move and change us. One of my, my most favorite tweets I ever saw in my entire life back when I used to be on Twitter, um, somebody wrote, whoever invented yoga must be rich. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Whoever stole yoga. because <laughs> Whoever stole yoga stole exactly got wasn't, very, wasn't, very, very rich. Wasn't, um, you know, when yeah. these people created it wasn't that way. Whoever stole yoga and packaged it is rich, you know. Yes. My, my friend Richard from Texas, some of you who read Eat, Pray, Love might remember him. He was, he was this guy I met at the ashram in India where I studied. And he said to me one time, the only reason, and he was great at resting. He was so subversive. Um, he was just so, he said, he called me groceries because I like to eat. Um, he said, <laughs> groceries, the only reason we still have a planet is because there are enough people who are quote unquote lazy. Mm -hmm. If everybody was actualizing themselves to what this capitalist culture says you're supposed to be doing, every resource on this planet would have been gone 150 years ago and there'd be nothing Uh, left. This is actually saving, resting will also save the planet. Um, It's an environmental issue as well. Absolutely. The press, late stage capitalism is killing the entire planet, the climate, all of it, it's all connected. We're doing we're over we're overworking, overstimulating the land, everything is just a full on 
violent way of extraction. And that's what capitalism does. It extracts. It takes and pulls from everything it can. And so this is important. It is environmental work. I do a lot of work in, in talking with people um, about environmentalism and doing a lot of podcasts on that. I just did an interview with an environmental magazine called Atmos that is really cool. And so I really believe deeply in land-based healing and like a lot of the work that you see of my fine art photography where I'm laying outside with other women laying and black women are resting on the earth. That's a, a project around me thinking about land-based healing and seeing us resting on the earth and resting with the earth and, and wanting to connect and slow down. It connects also with agriculture when you think about plantation labor and what it did to the earth and what my ancestors were out there doing, working 20 hour days in cotton fields and you know, rice fields and like the extraction of their bodies and the extraction of the land, all it's all connected. That's the thing about it. We deepen, if we can slow down enough to deepen into what is really happening to our earth, you'll see the effects of it, you know, in our bodies and how we treat each other and also what's happening with the climate right now. Trisha, you're amazing. I love you. I love you. Um, can you <laughs> I, I just, I feel like full of spirit and joy and um, cleverness, tricksterness, the tricks. wild possibilities, yes. beauty, compassion, gentleness, um, humanity, it's all in you. It's all in your work. Um, this is the book, everybody. Rest is resistance. Please, yeah. please read it. It's born of dreams, and um, and it's so such a beautiful dream that you dreamt to dream this book into being. I wondered if you could take us out. Do you have the book in front of you? I do. Okay, I didn't want to assume you did. Okay, on page one hundred and one, um, there's a poem, prayer, evocation. And I wondered if you could just take us out with that. And, yeah. um, and, oh, yes. And, and I'm going to say my goodbyes now because I don't want to speak a word after you say the last word. I want you to have the last word. So everybody, if you could just throw up a bunch of hearts for Trisha again, for her time, for her brilliance, for her uh, her imagination, and for what she has to bring to all of us. Um, you're so very loved. And uh, and I'm going to say goodnight to everybody. And I want you to take us out, please, with this beautiful piece of writing. Thank you, Elizabeth. Love you. Rest is real life conversations. I don't know any other way to go. Rest is the roadmap, the guiding force, a truth teller. Rest is a meeting with self with a typed agenda. Rest is on your knees whispering words silently on the right side of your bed. Rest is lunchtime dreaming. The energy of the Rastafarian who showed me how to pray standing up with my eyes open, hands stretched wide. Because how will you see and know when prayers are answered? Rest is holy oil from my mama's wooden dresser, Pompeian olive oil, the fancy kind in glass blessed by the elders, poured over our heads as we rebuke the devil. Rest is the laying on of hands, a force field all around you. Rest is a dream made real, a portal, an honest place, a trusting place, a sacred refuge, a dissertation length longing. Rest works. Rest dreams, infinite power moving, care surrounding us. Rest is a gift and an antenna, an ancient call dangling on the tips of tongues from a head lightly connected on a silk pillow. Rest is holding us close. Rest is home. Thank you. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you so much. We will I couldn't help but say thank you. <laughs> the mantra is we will rest. I say that all the time. Like we will rest. Remember that we can rest, we will rest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.